All right, I thought what we'd do today is take a look uh, at uh, John's Gospel, Paul's Gospel, and God's good plan for today. Uh, if you've been following along in our Roman study on Sunday, you know that's what, where we are in chapter 12 of Romans. Uh, we've covered the first 11 chapters of Romans. We've had this, remember, Romans is the foundational document of all true Christianity. Uh, and we've had the first 11 chapters. Uh, and now he says in chapters 12 to 16, he says, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to ignore it? Are you going to forget it? Are you going to uh, go to something else? Or are you going to make use of it? Uh, and I think that the, our Gospel of John here gives us a perfect opportunity, a perfect example uh, to look at what Paul's talking about in Romans 12 to 16. Uh, and the, the question is just set up like this. For the mind that's renewed with Pauline grace, mystery, truth, those first 11 chapters of Romans, uh, for that mind renewed with Pauline grace, mystery, truth, which gave us salvation, which gave us sanctification, which gave us glorification, which explained what God's doing today, Romans 9 to 11, and is transitioning from Israel's prophetic program to the body of Christ mystery program. Now now that we have all that information, are we going to let that, those truths uh, renew our mind? And if they renew our mind, they're going to point us to the cross of Christ where he died, where God's love was displayed when he sent his son to go to that cross to die for his enemies. And that's what the Holy Spirit takes, overflows our hearts uh, and the, with the love, that love of God at the cross of Christ. And that's what motivates and empowers us through the Spirit to walk in a way that's well-pleasing to God, to serve God by serving others. Now the question is, uh, are we going to do it that way or are we going to go to some other way? Are we going to go to a way that the world says? Are we going to go to the way that a mostly apostate Christianity says? Are we going to try, do we think we can come up with a better way than God's way? And that's where I think John's gospel and Paul's gospel is going to come in. Paul throws down the gauntlet in chapter 12. What are you going to do? How are you going to operate? Now that you've had this foundational uh, book on Paul's mystery truth for the body of Christ, what are you going to do? Are you going to go back to Israel's prophetic program? Are you going to go back to the world? Are you going to go back to the law? Are you going to go back? Or are you going to go on with God and Paul? Uh, and that's really the question I want to look at here uh, as we look at this particular situation, how to handle the gospel of John, how to handle the gospel gives us a perfect example uh, for doing this. Will you participate and advance God's policy of the good, which flows out of the first 11 chapters of Romans, or are you going to find another way to do it? Uh, even if, if good people and, and uh, Christian people say that's a better way, are you going to stick with God, or are you going to do it some other way? And, of course, any other way but God's policy of the good uh, it falls under the sway of Satan's policy of the evil. And that's what I'm going to try and bring out tonight. So the Gospel of John, when we think of the Gospel of John, when we think of the book of Romans, the, Paul's Gospel, uh, it has to do with the body of Christ and God's mystery program. That's not what John is about. John is about, he contains the instructions uh, for salvation and edification in God's prophetic program for the nation of Israel. That's where you go to find out about Israel's national salvation and edification of believers and that believing remnant. That's not what God's doing today. Got what God's doing today was put forth in Romans 1 to 11, and of course the rest of Paul's epistles, but uh, since we're in focusing on Romans, that would be where you go for that. This means that the Gospel of John does not contain God's instructions of salvation and edification in his, for, in his mystery program for the body of Christ. You have to go to Paul's Gospel. That's why it's called Paul's Gospel. That John's Gospel has to do with salvation and edification in Israel's prophetic program. Paul's Gospel tells us about salvation and edification in God's mystery program. And he's explained all that in the first 11 chapters of Romans. So the question is, are we going to let our minds be renewed with Pauline grace, mystery, truth? Or 
or are we going to go operate according to something else? Even another uh, gospel in the Bible, like John's gospel or Peter's gospel, the gospel of the twelve, the gospel of that believing remnant. What are we going to go with? Uh, he throws down the gauntlet. You have to make a choice. You can't do them both. Uh, and we'll see that as we go on here. And I think the best starting place to get the picture of this uh, is to remember how Satan works. Uh, Satan doesn't work the way they show him in the Halloween movies. Uh, he's not a, a red dragon with smoke coming out of his nose and fire out of his mouth with a pitchfork uh, and, uh, all, and engaged in gross immorality. That's not what Satan's doing. Go to uh, first, or 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. And let's see what, how Satan operates. How does Satan operate? Uh, it's not the way the world says. That's the, way, that's the way Satan wants you to think he operates, so you don't know him when he comes the real way. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Uh, see, Satan doesn't come uh, engaged in gross immorality, breathing fire, being spooky and all that. Uh, he comes as an angel of light. He transforms himself. He gives the appearance. Uh, he's a, 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 per, a, a thing of God, a, an angel of God, when in fact he works, and that's to fool us, and he works contrary to God. And what about Satan's cohorts, whether they're uh, and, and the angel, fallen angel, angels or uh, his cohorts in the human realm? Uh, verse 14, and, or verse 15, therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, who end, whose end shall be according to their works. Satan and his co-workers, whether uh, in the angelic realm or the fallen angelic realm or the human realm, they are dressed as, uh, as, uh, as men of righteousness. They're, they're trying, they make it look good. They take, their goal is to take you to other parts of God's Bible and say that they're applicable to today and throw you all off course. It sounds biblical, it sounds good, it sounds godly, it feels right, but it's contrary to God, his word, and his good plan for today. That's how Satan works. Satan and his cohorts uh, deceive us by making things look good, by making things look like they're from God, uh, and they look biblical. They got, he, he dresses it up with Bible verses, and it looks biblical uh, when they're really contrary to God, his word, and what he's doing today. Steering people, and one of the ways he does this is by steering people to John, instead of to Paul. It looks good, it sounds good, it seems godly, uh, it's biblical, but it's contrary to what God's doing today. Steering people to John rather than Paul is an example of this. It looks and sounds good and godly when it is in fact contrary to God's good way for today. We read that in Romans 1 to 11. He laid it all out for us. He gave us there how God is saving people today, how God is sanctifying, glorifying, uh, and what he's then involved them in and what he's doing today in Romans 9 to 11. You won't find any of that in the gospel of John, John's gospel. You'll only find that in Paul's gospel. That's why it's so deceiving. That's why it tricks us. That's why we need to be so careful we don't fall into Satan's traps. Steering, steering the lost to John for salvation is wrong uh, because God's saving message for today, the gospel of grace, based upon the good news of the death of Christ for his enemies, uh, isn't there. You can't find it there. You have to go to Romans. You have to go to Paul's, Paul's gospel.
You can only find it in Paul's scriptures. Uh, that is why I say this. God's that is why God's saving word today is called. Uh, Paul says it over and over and over again. The only thing that can save and edify uh, either a lost person or a believer today is my gospel. He says Paul's gospel in the context of the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Which was kept secret since the world began to mean nobody else had it. Nobody else knew about it. You can't find it anywhere else, not even in John. To steer the lost to John for salvation is to send them on a wild goose chase because it isn't there. Uh, to steer the lost to John for salvation instead of Paul is to steer them astray because it adds complexity and confusion to the clarity and simplicity of Paul's gospel. And we'll see that as we go through here. Uh, and that is what Satan's done since the beginning. If you're still in 2 Corinthians 11, go back to verse 3 uh, where he brings this up. Uh, he's talking about uh, first and second Corinthians has been a constant battle with Paul because uh, the Corinthians are tr are picking other apostles. They they don't want the, God, the apostle God gave them, so they go to other apostles like Peter, the apostle Peter, or the apostle John, or other apostles. And Paul fights this for the whole time in First and Second Corinthians. And here, that's what we're reading about in chapter 11 here. And he says, uh, look at verse 3. We'll just read this short verse. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through the subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The simplicity of Paul's gospel, the simplicity, uh, the clarity of Paul's gospel. When you send people to John, you are adding complexity, you're adding confusion to the clarity and simplicity of Paul's gospel. And that's uh, falls under the sway of Satan. When you say you're sway, it doesn't mean you're satanic. It doesn't mean you're possessed by a devil or anything. It just means you're following his plan book rather than God's plan book. The only way to be saved uh, from God's, in order to be saved using, God, using John's gospel is to remove John, uh, take his words and remove his meaning Throw out, and you know when you remove John's meaning from John's words, you're really throwing away God's meaning. You got to remove God's meaning from John, throw that away, and put in there Paul's meaning. And then, yes, people can even get saved from that. I know that because uh, I was saved through that. I remember Awana, the first verse, one, I, I, in my mind, I remember it as the first verse I memorized, John 3.16. And I went in, I was all proud, I recited my Bible verse, and the leader said, uh, do you know what it means? And I said, no, I don't know what it means. Uh, and so he proceeded to tell me what it means, but you know, when he explained what John 3.16 means, he didn't use anything John actually said. He used what Paul said. He went back and he told me I was a sinner in need of a savior. That's Romans 1 to 3. He said Christ went to that cross to redeem me, to set me free from my sins, pay the penalty for my sins. Roman, last half of Romans 3 on into chapter 5. And then he said so that I wouldn't have to pay the wages of sin my myself, uh, but could receive the free gift of eternal life. And he throws in Romans 6, uh, 6 what is it, 23, um, at, for good measure. So he took Rome, or, uh, John 3.16, took out what John, because John doesn't say any of that stuff in John 3.16. If you think that's in John 3.16, it's because you're reading Paul into that, because John doesn't say any of that in there. And he, so my leader, I didn't know anything about John 3.16. My leader, my Awana leader didn't know anything about John 3.16, but someone trained him in, Pauline, in the Paul's gospel. He knew what that was, and he told me that, and I believed that, and I was saved unto eternal life. 
The only way anyone gets saved today is by believing God's one message for today, a saving message for today, and that's found in Paul's gospel. You won't find it anywhere else. This is, and when you do what my uh, Awana leader did, uh, you're what, what they call reading Paul into John. Uh, it will get people saved, but, here's the big but, it, it covers up the clarity and the simplicity of Paul's gospel with whole levels and layers of complexity and confusion. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of the night looking at, how it adds to this confusion. Uh, and it, 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 contrary to human wisdom, contrary to religious wisdom, contrary to what we think, it doesn't make, uh, these, make uh, it easier for the lost to get saved, steering them to John. It makes it harder because it adds confusion and it adds uh, confusion to that and complexity. And next, what we're gonna see also tonight is it leads them through the doors of all the errors that historic Christianity has made. To send someone to John's gospel instead of Paul's gospel for salvation and edification today opens the doors to many of the destructive errors that have come to characterize most of what I always call that historic Christianity, which of course most, the bulk of historic Christianity is apostate. Uh, and the very reason it is is because a large, one half of that large apostate historic Christianity, uh, instead of going to Paul, they went to Peter. And then you have an Eastern version of that apostate Christianity, and you know who they went to? They went, instead of going to Paul, they went to John. And it's all apostate. They're all apostate. I had an email from someone who works with Greek Orthodox people, and he's so thankful for our series on Romans because he said it's, all they want to talk about is John, and he said, now I know how to point them to Paul because that's the only way they're going to get saved is to go to Paul. They can have all the John on the eastern side and all the Peter on the western side, it doesn't matter. The only one with God's saving message for today is Paul. And we go look at some examples of this now. So let's go to, let's uh, go to John. You send someone to John, uh, you know there's an even easier verse than John 3.16. Go to John 15. John 15, 13. John 15, 13. And what I want to show now uh, is how leading someone to, uh, to John instead of Paul adds layers of confusion and whole levels of complexity to the simplicity and the clarity of Paul's gospel. And then uh, if it manages to get them saved in John by reading Paul into John, they manage to get saved. It, it, going to John will open the door to all kinds of other problems. All the problems of historic Christianity come by going someplace other uh, than Paul. And here we have an example of it. Let's find and look, read a verse that's even easier uh, than John 3:16. Uh, go to verse 12. Let's go to John chapter 15, verse 12. This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Okay, well, how has God, how has God in Christ loved uh, this believing remnant of Israel? What is the greatest love in Israel's prophetic program? Verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his, what? His friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Now, if you send someone to John and they read that verse and that's who Christ died for and that's what they got to do, uh, what, do they, what would they think? If this is where you get salvation, Christ died for his friends, what are you going to think? You're going to think, well, I have to make myself a friend. Otherwise, God won't save me. Christ didn't die for me if I'm not a friend of his. So if you, have, uh, if you tend more toward a religious bent 
you're going to go into a religiosity, as I guess you could call it, religiosity. You'll think, oh, I have to join a religious system, join a denomination, join a, a, a so-called Christian religious system. I have to go through rites and I have to go through rituals. I have to do some works, make myself God's friend, give enough money, attend often enough, whatever, all the different things they have, and then I'll be a friend of God and then he'll save me because then I'll be someone he died for. And of course, we all know here to now that uh, because we're born ungodly sinners on enemy status to, before God, completely weak, that doesn't work for anyone. No one can make themselves a friend to God. And that's why you have religious systems that say they can uh, because then you're dependent on them. Nobody can do that. So on the one hand, that opens the door of apostate religious systems. I have to make myself a friend. I have to go through a rite, a ritual. I have to uh, go through some religious system that will turn me into a friend of God. Then God can save me. You open the great error that's a, that, that take over most of historic Christianity, that religious, apostate religious systems. Or if you tend more towards uh, believing reformed theology, then what are you going to think? Well, of course, in Reformed theology, they acknowledge inherent sin. Uh, they know you, you're weak, a born ungodly sinner on enemy status before God, and can't do anything pleasing to him. So what are you going to think? Well, how am I going to become a friend? Well, I can't do it myself, so God must predetermine who's going to be a friend. He must predestinate who's going to be a friend and who's not going to be a friend. And then you have another great door of error of historic Christianity, uh, Calvinism and all its guises, all because they went to John rather than to Paul. And then you have one more option here, or maybe you think you made yourself a friend to God through some religious system or because God predestinated you, uh, and then you do something really bad and, and you don't feel like you're his friend anymore. Well, now you're going to think you lost your salvation. You're not, and he does away with the doctrine of eternal security. Another great error of historic Christianity. Now, if you just went to Paul first, if you went to Paul's gospel first, it would do away with all that. Uh, and uh, by going to John, uh, you're opening the door to apostate, entering apostate religious system, entering uh, into uh, Calvinism and all its disguises, uh, and entering into a loss of eternal security. All these errors. Did you hear that big clacking sound? That was Satan's trap snapping shut on the poor soul sent to John for salvation and uh, Christian walk instead of Paul. Because if you go to Paul, uh, if you just went to Paul's gospel in the first place, all these errors would immediately disappear because Paul explains uh, that while in John's gospel, uh, in God's prophetic program with Israel, which is what John's gospel is all about, while the greatest love there is that Christ died for his friends, that's not the greatest love there is. Go to uh, Romans 5. Romans 5. That's not the greatest love there is. There's a greater love than that. There's a greater love in Paul than you're ever going to find in John. A way greater. The greatest love in John is that Christ died for his friends. And then that opens to all, the, all those historic uh, Christianity's errors. How do I become a friend? How do I maintain myself as a friend? What if I stop being a friend? And, but n that's not the, what Paul talks about. Paul tells us the greatest love. Look at verse 7, or verse 6. This is Romans 5, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, when we couldn't do anything, when we couldn't make ourselves a friend to God because we were without strength, the way we're born into the world as sinners. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now he's going to talk about what John said, verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man uh, will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. That's John 15, 13. Christ died for his friends, the just, the righteous, the good. That's the greatest love in John. But it's not the greatest love in Paul. Uh, John's love isn't enough to save an ungodly sinner on enemy status before him. 
but the love in Paul is. Look at verse 8. But God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's a greater love. He died for his ungodly sinners. Now look at verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The greatest love you're going to find in John is Christ dying for his friends, the just, the good. Paul explains the uh, infinitely greater love than that, and that's Christ dying for his enemies, the ungodly, the unjust. And that's the state we're born into, and that's the only thing that's going to save. And that does away with all those problems. If he saves his enemies by grace through faith, then that does away with religious systems. You can't make yourself a friend. It does away with Calvinism. Uh, and it does away with Calvinism because it doesn't call on God to predestinate. He offers it to all sinners, all our enemies before him. He's reconciled the world to himself in Christ, according to Paul. And now he offers that reconciliation to all to receive it on basis of grace and faith. Just believe in the uh, death and resurrection of his son on that cross for you and your sins and to free you from sin, the power of sin. All who believe are part, uh, will participate in that greater love, the greatest love at all that you can't find in John. Let's look at some other examples here. Uh, if, you, if they just went to Paul first, the apostate religious systems would all vanish. Uh, Calvinism and its cousins would all vanish. And God saving ungodly sinners on enemy status before him would remain. It'd remove all the problems. It'd remove all the problems. Let's look at another example. Or what if you think you got saved in John 3.16, like I did uh, for a long time before I realized I wasn't really saved by believing John 3.16. I was saved by what my uh, Awana leader told me from Romans and put that into John 3.16. Uh, but let's just say I thought I was saved uh, from John 3.16. Well, what would be a logical thing? What would be just a normal thing to think? Well, if John 3, the beginning of John 3, uh, saved me, did something as important as provided my salvation, well, then I better go read some more of John uh, and see what else he says. What, are the, uh, he, what other instructions does he give me? If you think you're saved by John, it would be a good idea to continue reading in John 3 for further instructions. And guess what? If you, when you go to John 3, well, let's go to John 3. Go to John 3. Guess what the very next thing you read is? John 3, verse 22. He's just finished uh, with the Nicodemus uh, um, uh, discussion and then what becomes a monologue, basically. He's finished with that. Now, the very next section is this big, long section, and look what it's on. Verse 22. And these things came... Uh, and, excuse me, after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized, water baptized. And John was also, John the Baptist was also baptized in, in Eon near Selim, where there was much water there. So you get saved in the first half of John 3, is what they say, what you're sent to do, what you think happened, uh, when really someone read, had to have read, if you're saved, someone had to have read Paul into John 3.16. You think you're saved from John. Now you go on to the last half of John, and uh, you're led into water baptism. The need for water baptism, that it, uh, how important it is, uh, and how, uh, how important and, uh, and how, uh, required it is. So what are you going to think if you're reading John? Well, if, I got, if John could tell me how to get saved, the next thing he talks about is water baptism. I better go get water baptized. And water baptism isn't even for today. And it's caused more, someone has said, more deaths in historic Christianity in the last 2,000 years have come over fighting over water baptism uh, within Christianity, whether it be apostate or believing Christianity, within that uh, and it's killed more people for, than any other doctrine in the, in the ch church. 
uh, anything else. It's caused more devices, and the ironic thing is, it's not even for today. But if you go to John, and you think you were saved from John, the very next thing he says, you need to be water baptized. So what are you going to do? You're going to go, and now another door, an error. Door leads you into the, another error of historic Christianity. We've already, just in two verses, two little passages, we've seen uh, to going to John, uh, we enter the door of apostate religious systems, we enter the door uh, of Calvinism, the era of Calvinism, we enter the door of the false idea that you can lose your salvation, now we're entering the door of you need to go through water baptism. Of course, uh, if you, uh, real, if, you had, if they had just gone to Paul's gospel, uh, that wouldn't be. And this is the way, this is a great example, I think, for showing how Satan works. Take something that he, he said, it looks good. It's biblical. There it is, right in the Bible. It's biblical. You dress it up with some verses. Look, even Jesus is doing it, so we should do it, of course. But it's not for today. And you see, that's what Satan does. Uh, and if he can get you to focus on baptism into water done with human hands, uh, guess what you're not going to be doing? This is the way the deception of the devil, this is the way Satan works. If he can get you focused on water baptism, what are you not going to be focused on? We're just humans. We have finite thinking, finite ability uh, to, uh, to focus on things. If we're all focusing on water baptism, what are we not focusing on? God's one spirit, which God isn't even doing today, isn't even involved in water baptism today. What are we not focused on? God's spiritual baptism, the baptism into, the, into Christ by the Holy Spirit, by the hands of God. And if you go, I've talked to so many Christians, they can talk your ear off about their water baptism. And then you talk about spirit baptism, uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit of the believer into Christ. They don't have any idea what you're talking about. That's because they've gone to John instead of Paul. That's how Satan works, to deceive. To get you, if he can't keep you from getting saved, he's going to try and throw you off course and everything else. Now, if they, he just had gone to uh, John, excuse me, to Paul, so let's go to Paul uh, and go to chapter 6. If they had just gone to Paul's gospel f first and only for salvation and the Christian walk, this air would be swept away. This error would be completely swept away because uh, you know what Paul, in chapters 3 to 5, he lays the complete groundwork for uh, salvation of ungodly sinners on enemy status before him, first looking at it kind of through the lens of a, of a, from the perspective of a Jew, then looking at it through the perspective of a Gentile. He puts it all together, gets everybody in the world uh, an offer of salvation they can understand, and that gets us through chapter 5. And you know what Paul leads us into? Go to chapter 6, the first verses of chapter 6. Look at verse 3. Verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore we are baptized with him, we are buried with him uh, by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead the, from, uh, by the glory of of the Father, even so also we should walk in newness of life. John, a friend, 316, if you go there for your, think you got your salvation there, and then you read more in chapter 3, he leads you into water baptism. Paul, when he gets you securely saved uh, and makes that, uh, clarifies it in chapters 3 to 5 of Romans, he takes you to spirit baptism. Water baptism isn't even for today. Baptism of the Spirit of the believer into Christ is. It's the one baptism, it says in Ephesians 4, that uh, God uh, has, is using today. It's the one baptism of God. But if Satan can get you focused on the, uh, water baptism in John, you're not going to know anything about the Spirit baptism in Paul. That's the way Satan's deception works.
throw you off course. Uh, and take someone to John and they're going to go through the door that leads to all the major errors of historic Christianity. Go to Paul, water baptism, poof, vanishes. He doesn't say anything about water baptism in the book of John. Or, excuse me, in the book of Romans. Uh, spirit baptism remains. John gets, got John, uh, if you think you got saved in John 3.16, you immediately go into water baptism. In Paul, you immediately go into spirit baptism, spiritual baptism into Christ. All the problems disappear. The, large, the whole air that's caused the deaths of more Christians uh, in the uh, historic Christianity just vanish. Everything they fought for, everything they were arguing, it just was just for nothing. That's called satanic deception. Getting people to go to John or uh, the Gospels or you Jesus in his earthly ministry or any place else except Paul. And the airs just flood in. Let's read a little more in John. If we read a little further into John's Gospel, it becomes evident that John's followers are to remain under the law. Uh, and if they, if they leave the law in John, uh, they're under a curse. Uh, he, we're, we read on in John, we're not going to go through all these passages, uh, but uh, he, Jesus is still going on the feast days, observing the days, doing the temple worship. Uh, not long after Jesus, uh, Jesus talks to Nicodemus in uh, John 3, you know what he does? He goes up to Galilee. And what does he do in Galilee on the mountain? He gives the Sermon on the Mount. And what's the Sermon on the Mount basically about? He's telling his followers, uh, and he's purifying the law for his followers so that he can put it in their hearts. John's followers were to remain under the law, and if they leave it, they're under a curse. That leads to another gr great error in historic Christianity, going back to the law, if not for initial salvation, uh, then for the ongoing Christian walk. And of course, you have the book of Galatians that goes into that. Uh, if they had just gone to Paul's gospel, however, that would have been uh, removed from the scene. If they'd just gone to Paul's gospel, that, that wouldn't be an error. It's not possible to get your information from, John, uh, from uh, Paul's gospel, Romans 1 to 11 specifically is what we're here focused on, uh, and come out the door with returning to the law. It's impossible. Go to Romans 3.20. Look back here to Romans 3.20. Look what he says here in, in 3.20 in Paul. Uh, now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith unto them of the law. That's Israel and her prophetic program. And that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may be brought guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law. It's without the law. It's without the law. Go to verse 28. Therefore, we conclude. He finishes this great section, explains salvation uh, and redemption. Verse 28, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Don't go back to the law. Go over to our sanctification, the Christian walk. Uh, and go over to chapter 6. And look, how does a Christian walk work? Most of historic Christianity, you got to go back to the law. You got to go back to the law as the standard for your Christian walk. But look what God and Paul say, verse 14. Uh, how are you going to have a successful, uh, victorious Christian walk? Verse 14, Romans 6, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. And that's Pauline grace. If they'd just gone to Paul's gospel, uh, there'd be no chance. Uh, and actually, in, then in Romans 7, he's going to show what happens when a believer today goes back to the law. And you read Romans 7, and it's complete despair, complete defeat. He throws up his hands and thinks there's no hope until Paul brings him back to grace, Pauline grace in Romans 8.
So if they just listened to Paul, all those historic Christianity errors would disappear. Flesh life under the law would disappear. Spiritual life under grace would remain. Let's read some more into Paul's or into John's Gospel. Uh, when we read more uh, into John's Gospel, it becomes obvious that John's Gospel is for Israel. He says at the very beginning, he's come to his own, the nation of Israel, verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 11. He says to the Samaritan woman, salvation is of the Jews. Uh, and Jesus' followers, uh, in, uh, when he sent them out on that, uh, that I guess you call a, a missionary journey, he tells them, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't even think about going to the Gentiles. Don't even go to the Samaritans. Go only to the house of Israel. John is all about Israel. And if you go to John and you think you're saved in John and you're supposed to follow the instructions for John, you're going to come out of John thinking you're Israel. Somehow you are Israel. And that's another great error of historic Christianity. They say we've replaced Israel. Israel gets all the curses and the church gets all the blessings. We're the new Israel, the true Israel, the spiritual Israel. You hear all the theological nonsense. That's because they went to John instead of Paul. And they think they're Israel. Another great error uh, in that, another great error, another great uh, satanic deception that historic Christianity has fallen on. If you send someone to John, they're going to see everything revolves around Israel. They must be Israel. Did you hear that big clanging sound? That was Satan's trap closing on that poor soul. When, uh, Satan wins one, the believer loses one. If they'd just gone to Paul, if they'd just gone to Romans, if they'd just gone to Paul's gospel and many places in his epistles, if he would just went to Paul's gospel in the first place, this error would disappear because Paul states categorically that we are not Israel, but the body of Christ. Uh, Romans 6, we're baptized into Christ. We be, those who are baptized into Christ are the body of Christ. Romans 12, uh, 3 or 4, I think it is, he talks about uh, we are the body of Christ. You can go to 1 Corinthians 12, and there's a whole chapter about it, and, and he mentions it everywhere. You can go to the first four chapters of Ephesians. You can go any, any place in Paul's epistles. And he claims uh, Israel has, been, uh, has stumbled and fallen, and God has temporarily set Israel aside and her program. We are not Israel. We are part of a new program with a new people called the body of Christ. And if we went to Paul's gospel instead of John's gospel, that error uh, of thinking we're Israel, we're placed Israel, new Israel, true Israel, spiritual Israel, they got all kinds of theological mumbo jumbo about it. All that just disappears. All that error, all that error of historic Christianity that's led so many millions astray would just poof, vanish. If they just went to Paul's gospel instead of John's gospel. If we keep reading in John, as we go on, uh, if you read, keep reading in John, you'll find that we uh, read about this in the first three chapters of John and other places, even at the end of the chapter before Pilate, he talks about his kingdom, his earthly kingdom. John and his followers' ultimate destiny is Israel's earthly kingdom. We read all about that in Matthew, we're reading about it in John. Uh, and uh, he's, he's uh, uh, preparing them. Uh, we read this again all in, in Matthew, and he's going to do it again in John. For their, their end goal is that uh, arrival of that and establishment of that earthly kingdom. And as they are heading to it, they're going to have to go through the time of wrath, the great and terrible day of the Lord, the time of wrath, that seven-year, what we call that tribulation period. They're going to go through that wrath. Well, if I'm in John... And I think I was saved in John, and John's instructions are for me, and I'm Israel, uh, then I must be going through that wrath. And you have a whole uh, book of the Bible, uh, one of Paul's books of the Bible, 1 Thessalonians, that address that error, uh, that uh, address that error. Uh, and 
all the worry, all the anxiety. You can read the last part of 1 Thessalonians to see how it was destroying the Thessalonian uh, assembly. Worried they're going to have to go through the wrath. Worried what's going to happen to their dead ones. Worried about all kinds of stuff that they didn't need to worry about. Because Paul, if they just went to Paul's gospel in the first place, this air would disappear. Completely vanish because Paul states categorically uh, that our destiny is in the heavenlies and that we will be saved from the wrath through, the, through that rapture event. I think you're here in Romans 6, at least I am, uh, but go back a page to Romans 5, in, to Romans 5, and let's just look at verse 9. Look what he says here. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. And if you went over to 1 Thessalonians 1.10, he calls it the wrath to come. You're delivered from that. You're saved from that. You're not going to go through that. All that false uh, eschatology, they call it, in theological systems of uh, historic Christianity just gets uh, cast aside if you just go to Paul and his gospel. It all disappears. It all disappears. Let's go read some more. Uh, and we're going a little quicker here because I want to get these uh, done. Uh, in John's gospel, Jesus' followers and Israel as a whole were given signs and wonders. All you got to do, as a matter of fact, the whole book of John is kind of, uh, people argue whether seven signs or eight signs or whatever, but there's a series of signs. And he does a lot of others that John says he doesn't even record. Signs and wonders are something for the nation of Israel. Well, we've already dealt with the error of thinking a person going to John, they're going to think they're the nation of Israel. They've replaced Israel. Uh, and uh, they're going to come out of that. Uh, and they're going to say, well, I should be involved in signs and wonders. I should have that. And you have whole denominations in error trying to recreate the signs and the wonders uh, of Pentecost and the early church and all that kind of stuff. Whereas... If you just went to Paul, uh, with Paul's gospel in the first place, uh, he, uh, we would know that God set aside his program with national Israel. And, with, and once you set aside it, the nation, God's program with the nation of Israel, there's no need for Israel's, national Israel's signs and wonders anymore. They ceased. They've been set aside. They're all done. But you have whole denominations out there trying to recreate uh, Pentecost. Waste. See, that's satanic deception. If he can get a whole millions of, of members of the historic Christianity involved in trying to recreate Pentecost, guess what they're not participating in? What God's really doing today. And so that's all. We could go on here uh, forever and ever, uh, basically, with all the problems with sending, especially an unbeliever, someone new, and especially a young Christian, to John. It's because, first of all, if they're unsaved, it's going to make getting saved much more, uh, ha much harder because it's going to add all kinds of complexity and confusion uh, because you can't find a God saving message for. Uh, for believers today in John, you find it in Paul. So either you or someone else is going to have to come and read Paul into John. And then even if you do manage to get saved that way, you're going to you're going to be ushered through the doors of innumerable errors, massive compute confusion, uh, impenetrable complexity uh, that arise when we send people to John's gospel rather than Paul's gospel to find out what God's doing today. What you get is a picture of the state and the ruin of most of historic Christianity and the, its impotence to participate and advance God's good plan. And uh, as we start to wind down here, a mind renewed with Pauline grace mystery truth. Notice it's Pauline and I get this from Romans 16, 25. Paul says there, the only thing that can save a sinner, save the unsaved, and edify a believer today in God's mystery program for the body of Christ is, Paul says in Romans 16, 25, and many other places, it's just there, it's very succinct and to the point, uh, is my gospel, Paul's gospel, i.e., 
Pauline grace, that means it's only from Paul. You can't get it from John or Peter or Christ in his earthly ministry or any of the other 12 or Moses or David in the Psalms or the prophets in the Old Testament. You can't get it from anywhere else, anyone else. And it's, uh, and it's a mystery. And he, expl he gives the definition of what this mystery is, something that God had kept secret since the beginning of the world. So here, Pauline means you can't find, get it from anyone else, not even John. And, and, and the mystery that was kept secret since the world began means uh, that you can't get it anywhere else either. It was kept secret till God revealed it to and through the Apostle Paul. And then he made it known to everyone else through his scriptures. You can't find it in John. You can't find it in Peter's epistles. You can't find it in the gospel accounts. You can't find it in Christ's earthly ministry. You can't find it at Pentecost. You can't find it in the Old Testament. You can't find it anywhere else. God kept it secret. He hid it, not secret in the Old Testament, hidden in God, it says in Ephesians 3. A mind not renewed. Uh, well, let's finish the, what we were talking about here. So, a mind renewed with Pauline Grace mystery truth and whose heart is overflowing with the love that it produces, and we've been over that many, many times, would simply not do this evil to others. Send the unsaved on a wild goose chase by sending them to John because the God's saving word for today isn't there. And they won't send a believer to John because it's just going to lead him going through uh, doors that lead to the errors of historic Christianity. you got to go to Paul. A mind not renewed with Pauline grace, mystery, truth, which is where all these ideas come from, will be deceived into thinking uh, that John says the same thing Paul says. He's saying basically the same thing. Uh, but John, I've heard this so many times, John says it's so much easier and more enjoyable. Uh, he uses shorter words. His vocabulary is easier, lower level. I've heard that. He, he has nice stories, kind of hallmark stories. It's like watching a hallmark movie. There's nice vignettes on mountainsides feeding uh, the multitudes and doing all this stuff on the countryside. It's more emotional, theatrical. Paul, however, as comes across, he, he's this guy that uses all those really big words that nobody understands, uh, all those theological concepts. So if John and Paul say basically the same thing, why send them to Paul? Just send them to John. We'll make it a little easier for people to read their Bibles. Sending them to John instead of Paul makes good sense to the human wisdom. Uh, when for a mind that doesn't rightly divide, that doesn't have, uh, doesn't understand Pauline Grace truth, hasn't been renewed with Pauline Grace truth, it makes sense. That sounds like a good idea. It sound, feels like the right thing. Maybe more people will read John than reads Paul. So let's let's uh, send them to Paul. Excuse me. Let's send them to John. Makes sense. Take some of the pain out of reading the Bible. Maybe make it easier. Maybe more will get saved. So that's human wisdom. That's not God's good plan for today. And that's where the satanic deception comes in. It's that kind of thinking. It's that kind of a way. John and Paul are saying basically these things. John says it easier and more entertainingly. Let's send it people to John. Paul's too hard, complicated. Uh, no one's going to pay attention to Paul. That's called Satan. Satanic deception. It sounds so good, but is really so wrong. And I hope some of the things we looked at tonight uh, explain why I believe and say that anyway. It doesn't make it easier to get saved. See, that's the deception of the whole thing. It doesn't make it easier to get saved. It makes it harder to get saved. It ushers them away from the clarity and simplicity of Paul's gospel into the morass of all kinds of confusion, complexity, and the errors of historic Christianity. Paul over and over, Paul over and over again warns against leaving his gospel. 
and apostleship to another gospel and other apostles. Uh, in Galatians, uh, they're leaving his gospel and going to another gospel. Well, guess whose gospel they're going to? You know, this is Reformed theology focuses on Galatians, and we're very thankful that Luther had done this, uh, but he doesn't go far enough. He just focuses on law versus grace. But why were the Galatians going back to the law? They weren't going back to the law because they were reading Moses and Deuteronomy and Leviticus. They were going back to the law because they were going back to the uh, gospel of the believing remnant, the gospel of Peter, James, and John. They were going back to John's gospel. And when they go to John's gospel, it says you're supposed to be under the law and you're supposed to stay under the law and you're supposed to operate according to the law. And if you leave the law, you're under a curse. Paul comes along in the Galatians 1. And he, says, What's, he says, you're insane. You're going to another gospel? You're going to John's gospel when you've got my gospel? What insanity that is. And he confronts James, Peter, and John. He says, they may appear to be pillars, but they're nothing when it comes to the mystery, my mystery program for the body of Christ. And he confronts Peter to the face. And he says, uh, you are to be blamed. Knock it off, Peter. Don't be taking uh, the body of Christ back to Peter's gospel or James' gospel or John's gospel. They need to stay with my gospel. And then you know what he does? He turns to the Galatians. He, now we're in Galatians 3, and you know what he says to them? Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you to leave the truth? Uh, what truth is he talking about there? Pauline grace mystery truth. How could you leave? You know what he says? Leaving this... Pauline grace mystery truth and going back to a Petrine or Johannine uh, uh, law truth. He says, somebody must have come and bewitched you. That's the only logical explanation. Someone must have come and cast a spell over you. And they're treating, using you like a puppet because there's no other logical explanation for why anyone would leave my gospel, my grace, my uh, program, to go back to John's, you must be bewitched. Somebody's got some kind of uh, overpower over you. He's speaking, uh, and that's all he can think of. And the Corinthians, we won't talk as long as about that one, but the Corinthians, Galatians were going to another gospel, John's gospel, Peter, James, and John's gospel, and uh, which brought them under the law, which... Paul uh, rebuked the, all of them to the face. And the Corinthians spends two long uh, books of the Bible, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and he's concentrating them because they were going to another apostle, like Peter, like James, like John. They were going to John. Why would you want to go to John when you got my gospel? Paul's gospel is the only way God has today for saving sinners and edifying believers. And Paul's gospel is the only way that can protect them from the snares of the devil, Satan's deceptions and traps, which most of historic Christianity has fallen into because they have left Paul and gone to John or Peter or Moses or David in the Psalms or Christ in his earthly ministry, wherever you want to go, any place except Paul. And it's going to uh, pull you into uh, the errors of historic Christianity. So we'll close with this. So how should we respond to those who steer someone uh, to John or Peter or James or even Christ in his earthly ministry or anybody else? Moses or David in the Psalms, whoever. How do you deal? What should your be response to that be? Well, we've just talked about it from Galatians. I kind of uh, got ahead of myself there a little bit. Uh, how, what should we do? We should respond the same way Paul responded. And uh, in Galatians, uh, after he rebuked James, Peter, and John, who appeared to be pillars in the, in the church, uh, the, the assembly of the believing remnant, 
which are part of Israel's uh, prophetic program. Now they're coming and trying to bring the, the body of Christ and Paul's and God's mystery program for the body of Christ uh, into their gospel. And it was messing everything up. And Paul first uh, puts them in their place. They thought they were pillars, but they're nothing when it comes to my program. And then Peter came. He, first of all, Peter's the spokesman, of course. And Peter came to Galatia and uh, tried to intrude their uh, gospel, John's gospel, his gospel, Peter's, James, and John's gospel. And, and they separated from the Gentiles. They put the wall of the law back up. And Paul blew a gasket. And he confronted, he withstood the uh, Peter to the face, don't bring the James, John, and Peter gospel into my body of Christ. It doesn't belong there. Get it out. And you Galatians, don't go back to that gospel. And they don't go back to it. They were never under it. Don't go to that gospel. So that's how Paul dealt with someone trying to go to Paul or to John's gospel. And he tells the Galatians themselves, oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth. And the truth is Pauline grace mystery truth, not uh, anything else. All right. Paul explains that the only valid way, and we'll close with this, the only valid way to use John's gospel. So how do we use John's gospel? We've got to go to Romans 15 for that. We've been over this so many times. I'm not even going to turn there. Hopefully this will come back to your minds. Uh, Paul explains that the only valid way to use John's gospel is to first be established in Paul's gospel. Romans 15 that tells them how to use the gospel accounts, including John's, doesn't come till Romans 15. So you've already gone through 14 chapters of Romans before you're even allowed to go to John or Peter or anyone else. And then he explains how to use it. And he says there uh, that going to John's gospel is for our learning. Well, what are we going to learn? Are we going to learn about salvation and edification and the dis dispensation of grace for the body of Christ and in God's mystery program? Absolutely not. Hopefully I proved that and shown that over the last hour. So what do we learn? We learn that when we read John or Peter or the gospel accounts or the ministry of Peter and the Twelve and Pentecost or uh, any of those, or Christ's earthly ministry and any of those accounts, Paul tells us in Romans 15, it's all about God faithfully. What we're supposed to get out of that is we're supposed to go to those accounts, know they're not to and about us, they're not uh, instructions for us to follow, but we can learn from them. Well, what do we learn? We learn when we see God faithfully fulfilling his promises to the nation of Israel, then uh, we can learn that he'll be just as faithful with us in the body of Christ. We learn uh, that we can count on the fact that he will be just as faithful to us in the body of Christ mystery program. And this will give us comfort and encouragement. This will give us patience and hope. That's the only way to use John or Matthew or Mark or Luke or the early Acts Paul ministry, uh, Peter and the Twelve's ministry, that's the only way. It's the only valid way that it's in accord with Pauline grace mystery truth uh, that gives a heart overflowing with love. That's the way it works. Any other way using John isn't under the sway of God's policy of good. It's under the sway of Satan's policy of the evil. Let's close with a word of prayer. <clears throat>